Okay. All right. So all of us are ready for what? Huh? For studying what course? Marriage and family. Okay. Is anyone married here? Oh, you have, we have two people married here. Nice. Okay. Komal and Akil. And uh, Moses and Arista Moses, I suppose, are also married. Okay. Quite a few people are married in the group. Wonderful. Okay. So how many years are you all married? Uh, Komal. Three years. Akil? Six years. Okay. And if, you, if those of you who are on the chat, you could put up Angeline, three years. Okay. So welcome to all the uh, online students as well. Thank you for joining in. I hope you have a great journey as we learn about marriage and family with the students here. Okay. Uh, I hope you all have all got the book. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, there's going to be interaction in this class. Okay. I cannot just talk. I have to hear people also. So I'd like to hear from you all. Um, even the online students would like to hear from you all, um, your thoughts, your ideas, what God is speaking to you. Okay, that's how we all learn together. Okay, thank you students for, for sharing your years of marriage. Wonderful. Um, okay, great. Right, so as we, as we move forward to learn, um, I'd like to hear from you when, the, when you hear about the word marriage, what comes to you? What's the first word, first thing that you think about when you hear marriage? Maybe the married people should talk first. Yeah? No? Okay. Even the online students, when you think about, okay, Angeline says it's God's idea. All right. Yes, Arista, please go ahead and, and uh, you know, either type or just unmute and speak. Marriage is a covenant, okay? Uh, Gartrude says. All right. My students here. Okay. Two imperfect people united by a perfect God. Nice. Okay. Komal? It's designed by God. Okay. What about my other students? Companionship. Okay. Sam says companionship. What else? I'm sure you'll have thought about it, isn't it? What do you think it is? Or what, what comes to your mind? Diksha? It's a blessing which comes at a certain time. Okay, someone says family here. All right, anything else? Blessy? Nothing. Okay, I, I'm sure you all have seen some marriages around you. Your parents, your siblings, your cousins, uh, maybe in your church there, church here. You've seen, right? So what comes to your mind? A new life? Okay, very good. New beginning? Okay. A life partner? Someone who you can uh, have life with. Wonderful. Great. Okay. So we're going to be looking at what marriage is and we're going to uh, go through a couple of, a lot of chapters. So I'd like you to think of marriage, when we go through this course, uh, look at it like, you know, you're, you're thinking about one man or one woman and how they journey through life till the end. Okay. So if you can imagine yourselves in that, that'll be great. Okay. Because you, I need you to also understand and begin to learn. All right. So why do you think it's important for us to learn about marriage and family as a Christian? Why should we learn it as a Christian? Come on. This is, this is, uh, class is all about talking and learning. Okay. Come on. So why should we learn it as a Christian? Or should we learn it as a Christian? Should we learn it as a Christian? Ah, then you should tell me why. Okay. It'll help you understand each other. Okay. Yes. Sister, can I say something? Please say. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, God has not um, made us to be alone. 
he wanted a companion so god had created eve okay. for adam okay all right so that is why you're saying that's that's what marriage my question was why should we learn it as believers as a christian why should we learn about uh marriage wonderful yes the design that we see in the world is very different from the way that god describes it and expects of it to be right and so you and i see so much of many kinds of marriages in the world around yeah what kinds of marriages do you see hindu marriage okay all right that's a marriage okay what are the marriages to you what kind of marriages do you see court marriage okay uh huh child marriages yes we see child marriages then what is the new trend now love marriages is from old only same yeah. sex marriages same sex marriages it's it's becoming a trend there are uh, i don't know if you all know that the catholic church has has sanctioned it as well right so what you see out in the world as against what god speaks in scripture uh, is two different things and for us or you know of of for those who belong to him we want to follow the marriage that he has defined for us in scripture yes so is that one reason why we should learn a bit learn about it yes okay and uh, so that's that's one of the biggest reasons why we want to learn about it also um who made marriages who designed marriages god so if god designed marriages his manual is the best thing to go for right you buy a nokia phone not nokia phone if you buy a samsung phone and you go to another company and get their manual will you know how to how to figure out your phone samsung phone no right you need that same manual isn't it so we have the manual that god's given us is his word to really understand and and see marriage okay so the bible is our standard and that's what we want to understand in marriage so are we are we all clear on that right okay so all, like all of you said god is the designer of marriage so let's let's read a couple of verses if you have your books that are opened you can read from there else you can read from the bible in genesis what is genesis chapter 2 verses 18 to 25 say can somebody read it thank you online students for your messages please keep them coming in okay please keep them coming in yeah shall I, shall i read sister yes please go ahead any of you all can read go ahead Genesis 2:18 to 25. God said, "It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, a companion." So God formed from the dirt of the ground all the animals of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man named the cattle, named the birds of the air, named the wild animals, but he didn't find a suitable companion. God put the man into into a deep sleep as he slept he removed one of his ribs and placed it with flesh God then used the rib that he had taken from the man to make woman and presented her to the man the man said finally bone of my bone flesh of my flesh name her woman for she was made from man therefore a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife they become one flesh the two of them the man and his wife were naked but they felt no shame okay. this is the word of god thank you so what is the, what is uh, the scripture say that god is the one who instituted marriage and what did he do he he uh, we, this this is a prior to this is all the story of creation so it says that god created all of his creation and what did he call his creation what did he say his creation was good yes and he also creates man and sees it is good but what did he he um, he say he said although the creation is good it is not good for man to be alone and so god saw that he needed man needed a helper and that's how 
God makes somebody that is suited for man. All right, and we and we we see that. So, what would happen if there was just man? Suppose there were no helpers as women. Men, there are many more men here. No? Boredom, okay. You would be lonely, right? You wouldn't have companionship, right? So God saw that man should not be alone. Would we also be selfish if we were alone? Would we be selfish if we were alone? We will know. I have one piece of cake. If I'm alone, I'll say, I want to eat that all by myself. But if I have a, a partner, a spouse, what to do? I can't eat the whole thing myself, no? Can you? No, right? So, so God knows that if you are alone, these are the certain things that can happen. So to ensure that man is not alone, to keep to bring him compa a companion, for him not to feel isolated, for him not to be selfish, God created who? God created woman or God created Eve. So who did the first wedding? Who did the first wedding? Who did the first wedding? God, yes. God instituted the first marriage. So that's what, what happened. Okay? So, so we say that God solemnized. He's the one who brought man and woman together and brought about marriage. So if we were to look at the definition of marriage, let's look at the next page, page two. The definition of marriage, it says marriage is a man and a woman leaving all other earthly relationships, embracing each other and becoming one person before God. Right? So uh, there are a couple of things that you would see over here. What, what are some of the key words that you would see in, in, that, in that scripture? Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 19, verse uh, uh, 5. So what does it say? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and two will become one. All right? So when, when God bought this companion, what did he want? man and woman to do? To leave. What does leave mean? Leave means to leave. Okay, and who, to, who should you leave? Father and mother. Sometimes very difficult, no? To leave father and mother. But what does this leaving mean? Okay, that maybe when we, we grow up, when we are in a family, we are so dependent on, on our father and mother, right? That everything, you may go back to your father and mother. But this leaving is talking about how you, although the word leave means that it is to forsake or to abandon, it doesn't mean that you should never talk to them. That's not what it talks about. It talks about a healthy leaving, which means you were a part of that internal unit now you're moving to form a new unit of your own. So that's what that leaving means. What does cleave mean? To hold on. You've seen gum. What does gum do? It sticks, right? So it is, it is to attach. It is to come together so much so that if you, if you glue two papers together, what happens? It sticks and it's almost like, and it's like it's one, right? You can't separate it very easily, isn't it? So you, cleave means to attach to one another, to form one bond. And then what happens? When you leave and you cleave, what happens? You become one, all right? So that's what, uh, what, what God designed marriage to be, that you leave, you cleave, and you join together. Okay? All right? So that, that's what... And, and you see that Jesus also reiterates this in Matthew chapter 13, 3 to 6. He brings about the same thing. He reiterates this as to what God did. Okay? He reiterates this and said, And God said, For this reason, 
a man will leave his father and mother, unite with his wife, two shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one. All right? So that, that's what, how we see as the um, definition of marriage. That's how God defines marriage. So, yeah. Sure, sure. A passage that we read that it's not good for a man to be alone. Does it also imply for a woman? It's not good for a woman to be alone. Yes, it intends for for both. It's not yeah. only a referral only to a man to stay alone. It's not good. It's not only implying to a man. No, it doesn't imply only to a man. Fair. And the second thing, when you're talking about leave parents, so is it like uh, I'm just asking you a point blank question? So yes, is it like uh, wonderful? Uh, you leave them physically and you stay completely separate from them. Okay, so we will talk about that as we come uh, come uh, around. But more so, in sometimes that may not always be possible, because sometimes when you're just getting married, for some reason you may not be as financially stable to take care of your your unit. So uh, it is definitely recommended that you take some time to form that unit of your own. Okay. But if there, but sometimes some circumstances, it may not just be financial. Maybe it is um, only one of your parents are alive, right? And and you may be the only child, and you you need to take care of that elderly parent. So the circumstances may change, but this doesn't only mean physical cleaving. It 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 has more to do with an emotional, um, sorry, physical leaving. It has more to do with an emotional leaving. Okay, where you are joining with one person, with, with your spouse, to form a new unit where all where you are, whether it's be, it is decisions, whether it's solving of certain issues, that you're doing this as a unit and not having the interference or the say or the, uh, the dependence from another source. Okay, but your circumstances sometimes may not allow you to physically leave. However, it is recommended if it is possible. Okay? Right? Okay. Anyone else has a question? Asapu, no question? Okay, very interested. Wonderful. You will have questions. Don't worry. Okay. So if God is the one who's designed the marriage, the person who can tell us about marriage is God himself. Right? So we're going to be looking at some biblical principles of how God has designed this marriage. And I think even as we are reading these principles, we should keep in mind that um, there may be, we may have certain understanding about what marriage is. Maybe we've heard from our friends, we've seen it uh, live, we've had bad experience probably of uh, marriages that we've seen. Uh, even as we are reading this and even as we're studying this, uh, the desire for God is that we align our hearts to what, to how God sees marriage and to not our experiences or to not what we have seen. Okay? Um, because yes, like we know, sin is in the world and you will have all distorted forms of marriages or relationships. But nevertheless, God has designed this to be a blessing. And that's what we, we should be focusing and um, filling our hearts with. Okay, so what's the first first lesson or, or perspective that we can learn is that marriage is a good thing. Can all of you say it with me? Marriage is a good thing. So if marriage is a good thing, yes. So what should happen if marriage is a good thing? We all should be married. <laughs> okay, all right. Now since marriage was designed by God, uh, he will only make things that are good. God creates things only that are good. So all of that which God created is good. And one of that is marriage. And it was designed so that it will become a blessing to those who are in it. Okay. Um, it, it was designed to really not just bless us, but bless who we're getting married as well as our generations that come after that. All right. So Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Can somebody read that? Page 2. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So what does it say? He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Now, 
uh, sometimes life is very difficult and you and what you what you probably what you've read like marriage is a good thing may sometimes be not seen in that reality maybe some of us have come from experiences where we saw that marriages were a bad thing however despite these challenges or despite what we are seeing in the world we choose to declare that marriage is a good thing right like any other issue or struggle that you have in your life when you choose to see it like the way that god sees it it's powerful isn't it right we can we are inviting god's word to take root in our lives okay so 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 make that confession i don't know what stories you have you have heard but make the confession that my marriage will be or is a good thing make the confession right now for all those of you who are not married start right now my marriage will be a good thing okay mama yeah so my marriage will be a good thing all right okay are we all here together or are we are we going to sleep no no okay all right so let's look at the second one marriage is an institution to be honored marriage is an institution to be honored let's read hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 somebody hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 honor marriage and guard the guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband god draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex okay thank you so how does ma- how does god see marriage as sacred what does sacred mean sacred is god sees marriage as holy it is to be it is to be seen with the holiness that how, of how he has created it to be okay and one of the ways of keeping it holy is through what does the scripture say sexual intimacy yes that sexual intimacy must be between just the wife and the husband all right or intimacy also any form of intimacy even emotional intimacy should be between the husband and the wife because it expresses what that they are one in marriage okay now we we do see that um often uh, you know people sometimes uh do not think that being sexually faithful is a big thing and if you actually speak to people in today's generation and in the world will will tell you that you don't have to keep yourself sexually pure for marriage but what is god's word say <coughs> it says honor marriage which means even when we are single we are honoring god when we wait for marriage to express or to to have that sexual relationship with our partner with our spouse right so even this is just not for people who are married it's also for people who are single to honor marriage and not get involved into any form of sexual immorality before marriage all right now having said this i know that there can be times that people fall into sin but what does god say when we fall into sin to repent to repent and come back to him because when we repent he completely accepts us he forgives and he accepts us so even if as single people or even if you're married if you're in sexual sin that is outside of marriage remember sexual sin is not just having uh, a sexual relationship with somebody else it could also be your um sexual thoughts it could also be the kind of material you use or the material you see the kind of um um connect that you make even on social media or you know maybe pornography all of this it says abstain from doing anything that will dishonor your marriage whether you're single or whether you are 
married. Okay? So that's what God says of honoring marriage. So what are the first two perspectives we saw? Marriage is a good thing and it's an institution to be married. Okay, I'm just going to... Diksha, you've asked a question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Diksha has asked a question. Is this rule made by people that girl always has to go to the man's house after marriage? Why can men not come at girl's house? Okay, very good question. All right. Now, you know, in the, if you look at in the Indian culture only, yes, this is a man-made principle. If you look among the Indian, in the Indian states, it's lot of the eastern states, that's Nagaland, Assam, the, after the boy gets married, the boy goes to the mother's home. It's because it's a matriarchal society. Matriarchal society means the, the mother or the grandmother is like the head of the home. But most of other of India, that's South India, Central India, maybe even Western part of India, uh, no, sorry, Northern part of India, are all patriarchal. Patriarchal means the, the, uh, the man or the father or the grandfather is the greatest uh, is the biggest decision maker so that's why this happens this girl goes to the man's house a man goes to the girl's house it's not it has nothing there's nothing biblical about that um so if if so what is but then you would see that even in the old testament culture you see that how rebecca leaves her home and comes to isaac's family so that also was a patriarchal culture right uh, what we are looking at is when we see this saying, even if you are to go to whichever side of the home, the family unit needs to build themselves up independently of the, the in-laws or the parents or all of that, right? The focus is not on much on where you stay, but the focus is on how you build yourselves together as a unit. All right? Clear? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, question. All right, so keep those questions coming in. So let's look at the third one. Now, very often, and I, and, and I think uh, the example of our country is, is uh, very useful. Why do people get married usually? Huh? To start a family. Okay. One of the reasons. Um, but generally, what do you see, especially among our Indian culture? Why do we get married? Or by the time the girl or the boy is around that marriageable age, what happens? Pressure. What? Social pressure. Right? So if you see that a lot of people get married because they're saying, oh, everyone's forcing me to get it. Or I am in the age of marriage. I'm 25, so I have to get married. So very often we look at marriage as a social institution. It's something that you have to do socially. If you want to be accepted in the society, you have to be a married person. If not, nobody will accept you. I'm sure we've heard some of that, right? Okay. But this is not a social institution. It's something that God designed it to be. So if we want to get married, we want to, we're saying that we want to get married because God has designed it for me. He has a good thing for me. He has great purposes for me through my marriage. Okay? And so when... We are seeing this as something that God instituted. We also see it not as a social contract. What is a social contract? If you and I were to do business together, what will we do? We'll sign a contract. That's a contract, right? We're telling everyone, okay, so uh, Diksha and I, we are building this house together. We're staying in this house. It's a social contract, right? But what, what is marriage? Is it a contract? It's a covenant. It's a promise that you are making before God to whom? The, to your spouse. Okay? It's a covenant that you are making to your, to your spouse. Let's read Malachi chapter 2 verses 13 to 14. Can someone from the online students read it please? Please go ahead. Arista, did you, I think you've raised your hand. Is it for a question or to read? Please go ahead and read. Oh. 
Okay, one of you all can read it. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. Malachi chapter 2, 13 and 14. And here's a second offense. You fill the place of worship with your waning and snivelling because you don't get what you want from God. Do you know why? Simple. Because God was there as a witness when you spoke your marriage vows to the to your young bride. And now you have broken those vows, broken the faith bond with your word companion, your covenant wife. Okay. So what what this is bringing about is that marriage is a union that you make um, that, that you make with, with actually uh, establishing a covenant with one another. And how do we do that in our marriage is really by the vows we speak to one another, right? We are saying, I'm going to be with you, you know, no matter what's going to happen, I will be with you. I will be your lawful wife. I will be your lawful husband. God's going to be my support. That is a vow that, you know, that, 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 uh, uh, that, that you're called to say. So that's a promise that you're making before God, right? That you will take this person for marriage, no matter what the, what the problem could arise, you're taking the person and you're making that vow before God. You're making that covenant before God, that commitment of that relationship before God. So it is a covenant of a lifetime commitment. Not till you're happy or not till you're satisfied, but lifetime. Right? A lifetime commitment. Okay, I think there's a question here. I'll just break for that. So Abhishek is asked, according to 1 Timothy 5.8, a man should provide for his spouse. What if somebody is willing to stay at home? Okay. Uh, now these questions we will answer later. But nevertheless, Abhishek, I think you, if you mean by saying, what if a man stays at home is what I suppose you're asking. So yes, every... God has given a responsibility or a role for a husband to take care of his family, to provide for his family. Now, if he chooses to stay at home, uh, and maybe if he has a good business running by, for himself, it's fine, as long as he's taking care of his family in some way or the other. Okay, That, that the husband is responsible for the family, it's okay. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what's important. If, if he chooses to stay at home and not being responsible, well, that definitely will cause a whole lot of repercussions for the marriage in itself, right? Which needs to be addressed, which needs to be taken care of. But God's word has a certain role for a husband and a wife. But we see that even wives begin to have begun to work, right? Uh, we don't pass judgment on anyone. However, there are certain principles that we need to take care of that there should be a provision of the man for the family and yes, for the woman to be the helper. And the helper can be in any way. Maybe it's looking after the children. It's maybe looking after the home. It may, it's maybe helping the husband uh, with, with an extra income. All of that, it's, it's how we fulfill that role that is most important. Okay, But we will come to detail of this question uh, later on. Maybe in the next chapter, we will talk about this a little bit more. Okay, All right, going to the next principle. Marriage is between one man and one woman only. Okay, so we read this verse in Genesis 2, 24, 25, that you, man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. So we must leave to cleave. So you must be able to leave in order to join together uh, to one another. So it also means that we should Leave all other relationships. What does all other relationships mean? Yes. Yeah. Leave. Leaving. Okay. So I think maybe I I, sh I should I should uh, um, specify that this leaving does not mean that you 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 know it's like throwing away something that you don't need. It's not that kind of a leaving. It is a healthy separation, okay? A healthy separation, yet a healthy connection. That's what it means. So a healthy separation means 
you alongside with your spouse, start life together, make your decisions together, communicate better, support one another, uh, problem solve together, right? Now, that doesn't mean you don't talk to your parents or share your de decisions with them. But they do not control or oversee you as a unit. That's what this leaving means. It doesn't mean to abandon them fully that you will never, never look at them. Please. Have we all got that? Give me a thumbs up for that. Yeah, because we shouldn't say, oh, we learned that we should, I, Daddy, Mommy, I can never, never see you again. That is not what it is. Okay, It's a healthy connection and a healthy um, uh, separation. Yes, someone has a question. Godino, you have a question? No, it's by mistake, uh, sister. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, so that's what we are talking about, all right? Now, this leaving also means leaving maybe a relationship that you had earlier. Okay, some relationship with either maybe your good friends. Every day you go out with them, play basketball, play this, play that. After you get married, What to do? Huh? Once in a while. Okay. So after you get married, who should be the priority? Your spouse. Okay. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't go out with your friends, but there is again a healthy separation. You should know your priorities and where the time should be spent. Okay. Yes, you should, should go out with your friends, you know, have a meal with them. It should, but not maybe like what you did as a young person. Or if you have had a relationship, a love relationship, to, to leave all of that before you join together with your spouse. And that is emotionally and in all ways to completely severe and cut off every relationship that you may have. Okay? So it's, and again, it's also about leaving your parents and other family relationships. Again, what I mean is healthy connection healthy separation, right? And yes, bless you. Mike, Mike. I just want to share a small instant what happened in our family, own okay. uncle and auntie. Okay. So they too work in government uh, office actually. Okay. So my uncle works in government. So they both got married. Okay. So after two months, not at, uh, uh, actually are uh, two months so what happened is uh, my uncle has a separate uh, connection with another woman even though married they, they got married mm. and uh, he knows about like this my auntie knows like okay he's having the personal connection and after two months again uh, uncle known uh, that the situation is uh, auntie, also, uh, auntie also have some relation with uh, another uncle mm. so they got like something happened they both came to our house, like my daddy's pastor. So they were asking what we should do. So what, uh, how can we handle that? Okay. What should we do? So he said, two people, A and B. A is the husband, B is the wife. After two months, A found C. Okay. And then after two founds, B found D. Okay. So A and C and B and D come together to his father's house and say, what should we do? Ah, A and C and B and D came. <laughs> yeah, anyway, four of them came. All right. So what should we do? Huh? So in God's eyes, how does this look? This is, this is adultery, isn't it? When you're already married and you are having a relationship with somebody else, some, somebody outside of it, it is in adultery. So what the thing is, uh, the, the woman who, like my uncle has personal, so she got already married with some man and she has a child also. She has a? Small child. Child, okay. Yeah. Huh. So they had already family. Okay. Don't know what about uh, her husband mm. but this guy like my uncle has a personal relationship yeah 
so no matter what c and b's life is a and b were committed to to be married right right and if they have had different relationships it is sin right we see that as something that is not in god's eyes and we see that as adultery so your so if if as a pastor your your advice needs to be that they break away from every adulterous relationship which means a should severe relationship with c and b should relation severe relationship with d and a and b should come back together and repent heal and move forward and allow c to go back to j and uh, d to go back i don't know whatever yeah so what whenever we are faced with situations where there are people who come in adulterous relationship now, now i there are situations when people get married they have adulterous relationship with somebody outside they have a family there and they have a family here and that just complicates matters so much more isn't it the sin is getting even more complex right and that's why we need to understand god's principles and not get into messy situations where the consequences of sin will be played out right if you have children in three marriages you have to take care of more people more the burden for you only no right so that's exactly why we learn about these these things okay i think there's another yes kofi you have a question yes please yeah go ahead mine is similar to what my brother just asked okay um in case before a gets married to b before the marriage between a and b okay a was won by god not to marry b but he disobey god's instruction and went ahead later on because of challenges that he faced he realized he had made a big mistake and wanted to go back to c whom god initially so mm. what should a do what should okay. be the right thing so kofi i'm just trying to understand you saying that when a was single he got married to c first Is no please true? no, no okay. please okay through his prayers god directed him to get married to c he was to god showed him that c is the wife but he and got married he, to b before he, that but he got married to b because of the things that he sees around b okay All and right. then when he went to the marriage the challenges that he is going through he now wants to revert to c okay so so kofi now um if a person is married to somebody now like you said a got married to b but he later felt that c was the person but but nevertheless he's already married to b you are to be faithful to b if you've made a choice to get married to somebody god desires that you stay faithful even if there are challenges and trusting god that god will work and help you with those challenges and forsake connections with c because b was his first accepted committed wife i hope that answers your question kofi thank you all right okay uh many questions uh should the wife always be at the forgiving end if the husband comes back to her after getting off track which happens in our society and we guide as well to be together okay now all of these things are going to be handled addressed much later we haven't started <laughs> and there are so many questions okay but quickly to share with you that uh my response is it's not about who should be the first one to forgive what is god's command for us we all are called to forgive right 
whether it be man or woman, husband, wife, we are all called to forgive. Although sometimes in the world it feels unfair that always it's the woman who is on the forgiving end. But God says, there will come a blessing to you when you are willing to extend the same mercy that God's given to you to others. Okay? So I would like you to look at it at a different perspective. That if God is speaking in your heart, the Spirit of God is nudging you to forgive someone, go ahead and do it. Don't look at right and wrong. Don't look at, I've done it 10 times, he's done it only once. It's so unfair. Do it because the Spirit is prompting you to do it. Okay, Lucy? All right. Shall we move on? Oh, we have just one more minute. Okay. So just quickly, just to finish off with this uh, uh, point that we started, is God, uh, that marriage is only between one man and one woman. As we were talking about, what is the current thing now? Same-sex marriages. What does God say about same-sex marriages? Yes, same-sex marriages or homosexual relationships is sin before God. There is, God does not approve of a homosexual lifestyle. And you can read that in Romans chapter 1, verses 26. God, yes, uh, does not, does, does not uh, accept the behavior, but that does not mean he doesn't love the people. God loves the people, but he does not accept the behavior. So in the sight of God, same-sex marriages is sin. So we, we do not condone that kind of a lifestyle. But we still love and reach out to them to show the love of Christ and the love of God there. All right? Okay? All right. Let's have a 10-minute break and we will come back. <laughs>